And there are the principles. And we have certain practices that follow these principles, but basically if you can get the idea of these principles down here, okay, I don't care what you do, what the practice is particularly, if it's following these, it's going to do a lot of, it's going to minimize that road's impact on surrounding surface water. It's also going to minimize the uh, negative impacts that drainage and surface flow have on the roadway. The benefits, again, this is the costly part, reduces the loss of surface aggregate, dam damage to ditches and outlets, re required cleaning and all that other stuff that goes on with uh, excess sediment moving in the, in, the, in the drainage system. It reduces this base saturation, which is one of the big problems during a freeze thaw or during heavy hauling periods. All right, it's the saturation of the base that uh, really, really uh, plays into the instability of the roadway. When the road is dry and hard, it can usually handle a lot uh, more than it can handle once the road base gets saturated. So if you can reduce that with some of these practices, yeehaw, everybody's winning. Uh, it encourages infiltration. You know, Pennsylvania, um, learned this from Brian Swistock, Pennsylvania is second only to Michigan in the number of citizens that get their drinking water from private subterranean wells, okay? And when we, ha when we have situations that kind of storm water drain all this water directly to the stream and don't allow it to infiltrate into the groundwater, uh, then we're going to be, we're working against ourselves for our own drinking water sources in, in this state, being, being that most people are going out and going to the tap in these rural areas and it's coming right out of the ground. Also, if we can reduce the connectivity directly to streams, we're going to lower flood flows. And that's a big thing when it comes to emergency management. The more, flash, more direct runoff we have and the more flash flood events we have, this is going to become a problem with more impervious surface where formerly we had a lot of infiltration going on. It's going to reduce maintenance and save money. Also, I like people to say one size doesn't fit all. When you're cruising around up there, consider the soil type, topography, hydrology. You know, consider if where a base doesn't exist, either you consider this Pinchot Road thing where you're building with larger stone or bridge rock, or use, or use geosynthetics to gain the same advantages. Full depth reclamation may be a consideration. I don't sit here and promote it either way, uh, but something to look into, especially when you look at the fact that some of these regulations, some of the concerns they're having out there with those roads that I showed, pictures I showed you, big high roads, okay? I'm driving all over Susquehanna County, places loaded with lakes and loaded with wetlands, okay? These roads cross across the base of a, of a, of a lake or a wetland area, and if you change that elevation and, and build that road up 30 inches high, okay, and, and now you're doing it in a hurry because you're not gonna get down there and replace that undersized pipe under the road because now that's gonna require a 105 and regulation uh, is going to require review at the office, it's gonna slow the process down, and, and you may say, well, if we build this up, we'll support our trucks. Just leave that old boiler pipe down there in the road. Well, the locals might know, hey, you know, every time we get, a, about every five years, we get a big event that the pipe can't handle and water comes over the road, okay? But when the elevation over the pipe's only that high, how much water can you back up, okay? But if you have a 40-acre wetland and now you put another 30 inches over top of that and it backs up that much more water, we're probably talking millions of gallons of water and then it overtops the road and starts taking, it as the outfall undercuts the road, if that road grade fails, it could be a real big safety issue, okay? So some of this stuff, whether you're a, whether you're a fan of the bugs and bunnies and all the environmental issue or not, public safety is a concern as well, all right? And DEP is actually tasked with, uh, with protecting public safety in this event, okay? So something like a full depth reclamation where you might be able to use existing stuff with some augmentation of materials and stuff like that and not gain significant elevation uh, heights on the roadway might be a consideration in, in cases like that where you might create a, uh, a safety issue. And then there was, uh, one of these practices is just if there's an alternative route. Right now I sit on the Center County Natural Gas Task Force and that's our next thing. Um, not publicized, I don't know who it was or what companies, but there was a report out there that in the past week, two uh, uh, Bald Eagle area school buses were almost clipped by water trucks supporting the industry, okay? Now this isn't necessarily directly related to an environmental issue, but 
you know, what we're looking at now is saying that between a certain time and a certain time, if there's an alternate route, if they can share that information of where the bus routes are with the companies that are, that are actively working in the area, they may be able to say to the drivers between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m., use this route, okay? We'll, we'll bond it or whatever is necessary, use this route, and that'll get them, it, it'll hopefully alleviate the safety issue there. That could play into the same thing if you have an environmental uh, concern on a certain area of route, okay? Margaret asked me, this wasn't originally part, so I don't know how well it'll flow with this presentation, but uh, Barry's doing some work and stuff on not only roads, but roads and bridges. Um, so, and I had done some stuff at the University of Pittsburgh Bradford that included bridges, so I kind of pigeonholed this stuff in here just to bring up the issue of bridges as well. I call it hidden concerns because this particular road, this is off of an anti-Marcellus drilling website for those of you, but it was a good picture that I, I found out there. According to the author or the photograph in this picture, uh, this particular road is, a, uh, is posted a 10-ton weight limit, okay? And it is being, uh, the, uh, supporting trucks for the industry or were using this road at the time. And the author claims, or the photographer claims that the, uh, uh, a truck clipped that guide rail and bent that guide rail and everything like that. And uh, that is a result of, of this heavy traffic on the road. Whether that's true or not, the reality is that Pennsylvania has its share of structurally deficient and functionally obsolete bridges. In fact, you know, well, this is actually a, 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 a bridge. This is Pennsylvania right here. This is the Delaware River. This bridge is actually open to traffic. I can show you some more ugly pictures of this, but I, I don't foresee any Marcellus trucks ever using that bridge. But this is a, one of those things you kind of got to look under the bridge to see what's going on here, okay? That bridge has been downgraded to a seven ton weight limit, and the guys who who travel that bridge every day, the township up there said they wouldn't even go that high. You know, they, they'll, they'll drive 10 miles out of their way to avoid that. But the question is, are these bridges gonna be able to handle the load, okay? Here in Pennsylvania, as of December 2009, right on the Pennsylvania uh, DOT website, was the information that Pennsylvania led the nation in structurally deficient bridges with, at that time, 6,060 of the 25,000 plus state-owned bridges were structurally deficient, and another 3,714 were functionally obsolete. The difference is, I have a definition for structurally deficient, I'll tell you in a second. Functionally obsolete means that basically the design standards that were used to make the bridge, uh, to build the bridge, are now, uh, were never designed to handle the amount and weights of traffic that they're seeing today. This was prior to, these designations were prior to uh, uh, Marcellus Shale development, okay? So it doesn't mean that they're not safe, it doesn't mean that they're crumbling, it just means that they were, the design standards are such that they never anticipated the weights and amount of traffic. Now, so that's, that's right off the website. In addition, uh, and those are eight foot span bridges or, or longer, okay, when they do the state designation. Uh, as of 9-10, uh, last month, the end of last month, We've got that number whittled down by five or 600. We're now down to 50, almost 5,500 state bridges are considered structurally deficient or you know, one in five of our bridges uh, out there. Uh, but 2,161 or about 34%, one in three of our local bridges are considered structurally deficient. Now, if you look at the little subnote here, it says that's a 20 foot road on a, on a local, 20 foot bridge on a local bridge. They changed the standard there from eight to 20. No one really knows, or we can't get good figures on just those bridges under 20, and we know there's lots of them out there, just how many there are out there and how they classify in this range. If we could assume that they're probably along the same lines or something, if, I mean, that's probably a, a, a conservative estimate to say that, that they're not any higher than 34%. It, it basically means that one out of every three locally owned bridges that you cross out there on some of these rural routes uh, have been deemed structurally deficient. What is that? Well, it's, an, it's a bridge that uh, has deteriorated to the point where you've got to closely monitor that bridge. This is, this is PennDOT's uh, um, definition. And they're saying it's a safe bridge, but in need of costly repairs or replacement to bring it up to current standards, okay? And um, Pennsylvania has the third largest number of bridges in the nation, but we lead the nation in the number of bridges classified as structurally deficient. The average age of our state bridges is 50 plus years old, okay? 
And they're not saying it's unsafe. They're just saying it's got some problems and it's going to have to be closely monitored. And I contend that with, uh, with the increases in traffic, and one of the things that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, early on in one of the Denton County studies, they, they looked, uh, some engineers looked at the number of uh, 80,000 pound water trucks traveling into a site to support the site. And the engineers, and I'm not an engineer, but the engineers uh, had determined at that point that it's approximately 9,500 to 10,000 passenger cars are the stresses that one 80,000 pound water truck puts on a road. Okay, I don't know how that's figured, but I can give you the, the reference as to where to go to get that information. If that's true, time? Running out of time? Okay. If that's true, then you're looking at about, uh, if you have 10,000 or 1,000 water trucks, excuse me, coming in, uh, you're looking at what, uh, 10 million ve uh, passenger vehicles? If this is a road that traditionally had 40 to 100 ADT uh, with prior to development, uh, you can now envision the type of stresses that are going on that road and the associated bridges. Shows that this is a bridge in Pennsylvania. You know, a lot of times due to budget constraints, we, we lapse on our maintenance. Uh, this is an interesting one. This is up in Clearfield County, and I want to state right off the bat, this is not a result of oil and gas traffic, okay? Actually, what happened here uh, was uh, this was a PennDOT salt truck across that bridge, okay? Ma maintaining the road, and just as he got to the other side of the bridge, the salt truck driver reported that he felt a little skitch in the back of the truck, and he looked back in time to see the bridge fall into the river, okay? But PennDOT never took that bridge off, or nobody ever took that bridge off the, the list of safe bridges to travel, okay? It probably had a posted weight limit, but it was still being traveled every day by the community. So it's kind of a, an eye-opener, all right? So the goal would be to minimize public exposure to risk, both fiscal and safety, and keep these roads open to support all the things we talked about earlier. Now in preparing for the future, I talked about these pre-haul upgrades uh, to both road base and drainage. And I say especially in weak and sensitive spots, this is where we have weak spots in the roads that might cause a catastrophic failure in the roadway. And the sensitive spots I'm talking about are those spots with, that the districts, and there's been an extensive assessment done, uh, have identified that these unpaved roads are draining directly to a stream and have direct stream impact. You know, we don't have to go crazy here, but you know, if we target a few good spots, we can uh, get a lot done uh, without going nuts. We have to consider there's additional drainage from uh, more access roads and more un, uh, impervious surface. Um, consider using ESM practices to create more durable, less costly roads and the use of these non-traditional techniques and kind of especially leading toward geosynthetics at this point. Um, Plan pre-all upgrades can uh, avert these catastrophic failures. They can improve public perception, regulatory compliance, and stream health. A lot of our improvements are overdue, okay? So, but I contend that it's very important to address these rural road infrastructure here to support long-term economic growth. And we've got the industry here that needs it, needs these roads, uh, and, and while minimizing the negative environmental impact of this growth. Pushing these ESM principles, I think that all these improvements should include these principles, but also input from the county roads department. I was just up on a road here, or the township roads department, I was up on a road that was uh, all, you know, upgraded, real beautiful and all this stuff. And on that brand new road had the deluxe treatment, there's water pumping right out of the center of the road from an underground spring. That spring didn't just show up there yesterday. Somebody probably on that road department or some local knew that thing was there. And with a little input from them, they could have done some, some things to, uh, to alleviate that situation and keep that road working effectively longer. Now somebody's gonna have to go back and fix it. Upgrades to existing drainage, base structure. Remember, there's gonna be future sustained heavy hauling. This isn't going away, it's a long-term development, okay? Particular attention to wetlands, streams, uh, known weak spots, and high density residential areas, okay? Those areas where most of your interaction with your residents is gonna be. And keep the interest of everybody in mind, including future Pennsylvanians. All right, this is to say that the old Band-Aid approach, you know, address the, address the cause and not the symptom, all right? And that, you know, a lot of things have changed, a lot of technology has changed, and I, I contend that we should be changing uh, the way we maintain these roads and the approach that we take, all right? We wouldn't be drilling into Marcellus Shale today without uh, adopting new technologies. Uh, we wouldn't be yakking on these things and, and getting our emails on the road, all right? 
And this is, this is going to last for decades, so why don't we apply the best technologies we can have and work cooperatively toward the future. So the road we choose, we can either be one step ahead or one step behind.